50 Trends Asia 2018 from Asia Tech Research, read by me, Graham Brown. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the 50 main trends that you need to know about in Asia in 2018 and give you a little bit of a personal perspective and some backstory to some of these trends as well. And I'll be here. I'll be popping up from time to time on the screen so you know that it's me talking. That's me. So let's get started. So what we're going to do now is look at the headline stats, the, the main data on the Asian market. Because Asia is getting very interesting right now. And there's a lot of people interested in Asia uh, for a very good reason. It's the land where, you know, now we're not just talking about cheap knockoffs. We're talking about people with money. Two thirds of the world's middle class will be in Asia within the next generation. And the rules are being rewritten all around us. So what does this mean? What does this mean for us as investment and marketers and anybody involved in the startup scene? Because it would be quite overwhelming. You know, Asia is a market of billions. It's unusual in the sense that what we're used to is markets of hundreds of millions and very defined markets. I mean, if you're based in San Francisco, for example, within a five-hour flight, you'll get to 550 million people. And if you were to have the same reach from Singapore, for example, a five-hour flight would get you three and a half billion people. So it could be quite overwhelming, I understand. But it's an adventure. So let's dive into this adventure. What I want to do in this video and audio is walk you through the key points that you need to know. Unpack all that noise, all that information that's flying around about Asia and those three and a half billion people right now and all that change and tell you what you need to focus on. Let's start here with economics. And the starting point for all of this is the red circle. What is the red circle? If you have a look at this chart, so this is chart number 12 in the 50 trends report, the red circle is Asia. It geographically occupies no more than about, what, 20% of the world in terms of the livable land surface but half the world's population live there. So there are more people inside that red circle than there are outside the red circle. Until now, that's been an accepted fact, but there was always a caveat to that fact. And that caveat was, well, you know, it's a market of billions of people, but, you know, these are billions of people who don't have much money. That is changing. And one of the reasons why that is changing is just pure consistency in economic growth. If you have a look at chart 13 in the 50 Trends Report, the top four regions this year for economic growth are South Asia, Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. So if you have Asia in your regional name, chances are you're in the top of the world in terms of economic growth. All the way down here, look at Europe North America, right at the bottom of the list. South Asia, for example, has a regional growth of 7.1%. East Asia, which is really Japan, China, and South Korea, 5.1%. So these are even developed economies yielding 5.1% return on their growth this year, whereas Europe's at 2%. North America is at 2.2%. And the Western Hemisphere in total, so the whole West is at 2.2% economic growth whereas Asia is at least 5%. So it's catching up and it's caught up and is passing in many ways. 2025, Asia will become the world's biggest trading block. What does that mean? It basically means that if you aggregate all that trade, all that activity, Asia will be number one region in the world. What's happened until now is that the world's biggest trading block has been North America and or Europe. And what's happened is, is a lot of the Asian trade has been export trade from Asia. Obviously, a lot of the stuff that's manufactured in China is heading to the developed economies. But now Asia will be the biggest market on its own. And the vast majority of that trade will be internal, meaning that it's self-sufficient, which is a significant shift in the geopolitical landscape from where we were earlier. Trend number four, the Greater Bay. If you're not familiar with the Greater Bay, it's this area here, which is the Pearl Delta, as it's 
as it's traditionally called, which is those 11 cities which are based around Macau and Hong Kong. Now, uh, until recently, all the activity really was in Hong Kong and then a little bit of gambling or gaming activity in Macau. But Hong Kong was the real nexus of that Pearl Delta. And then there were these cities that sprung up around the Pearl Delta on the China side of the border. So Shenzhen and Guangzhou and so on. And well, now that wealth is really spreading and China is taking a very proactive approach and building the connectivity within that region. So what's happening now, for example, there's they're building the longest bridge in the world between Macau and Hong Kong, which opens in 2018. I believe it's 50 kilometers long. And all of these 11 cities are being joined up gradually such that now you have this hub which will become one city and it's one greater bay and it's deliberately called the greater bay because it's a comparison to san francisco bay and it leads as we'll find out later on in terms of innovation and certainly in terms of wealth creation and a lot of entrepreneurs are gravitating towards the greater bay because they understand that this is the potential financial capital of the future and it's happening right now so quotes here from Tony Verb from Greater Bay Ventures says that the Greater Bay has 66 million people on $1.3 trillion in GDP. It's not happening anywhere else in the world and it won't happen anywhere else. It's a once in a lifetime process. So we're seeing a flight of talent now out of other places in the world like Greater Bay or what, sorry, what was San Francisco Bay before Silicon Valley into places like the Greater Bay. Switching gears a little bit here now. Look at the world's fastest growing economy, Vietnam. Vietnam is growing at 7.9% annually, I believe. And it's not just about being the world's fastest growing economy. Well, there's also another aspect to it as well. I mean, given Vietnam's history, it's not a great history in the context of globalization. You have superpowers like the US and the France who have meddled in Vietnamese history for many, many generations. However, Vietnam was the most optimistic country in the world when asked the question, is globalization a force for good? Vietnam ranked at the top of those countries. And interestingly, countries like USA and France ranked towards the bottom. I find that very interesting because given their history, they should be at the bottom. But now here is a generation of people in Vietnam who didn't live through the Vietnam War, were born after 1979, who were born in the 80s, who have everything to win and nothing to lose. And they're very optimistic and it's a fast growing economy. And we're seeing this all over Asia, this creation of these hubs of energy and capital. Shenzhen, China could become the world's financial capital within 20 years. That's very realistic as a proposition. Uh, most people don't even know where Shenzhen is, but it's happening right here, right now. I mean, if you know electronics, for example, Shenzhen claims to manufacture 80% of the world's economics in some part. So any electronic item, so your mobile phone, your laptop, whatever, 80% of those items have some part which was made in Shenzhen. Of course, that's the manufacturing base, which later converts into capital creation. As we're seeing all over Asia, there's this three-step process. One, which is a demographic advantage. Two, which is the manufacturing advantage, competitive advantage, and three, a capital advantage. So what once started off as markets of billions and lots and lots of cheap labor is now converting into an economic advantage where you have this manufacturing base like in Shenzhen. And now that's creating wealth and capital beyond just manufacturing of people now getting into startups. So we're starting to see this third phase of emergence of Asia. And there is work to do. I mean, China isn't the most economically free country in the world, but Asia leads in terms of economic freedoms. And you would have thought the land of the free, so the US was the most economically free country in the world. But according to the Heritage Foundation and Wall Street Journal in 2017, the top five countries in terms of economic freedoms, and they've ranked these on a number of criteria, including taxation, red tape bureaucracy, visas, ease of doing business, and so on. Those top five countries are Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, Taiwan. So Asia occupies three of the top five countries in the world for economic freedoms, which is surprising, really, that, you know, 
you would have thought it was UK, USA. Well, Switzerland's not a, a surprise there, but those are the countries you would have thought near the top, the bastions of capitalism and economic freedom. And you may say, well, it's so much easier to be economically free when you're a small country of millions. But, you know, when you're like a 300 million plus, which the US is, it's a lot harder. But the, to countenance that argument, any entrepreneur would say, that's not my problem. That's the problem of the country or the region. And I know Hong Kong isn't traditionally a country, but I'm going to call it a country for the context of consistency here. That that problem is not a problem for the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur should go where they're treated best. And if they can make a better of it starting up a, a, a company in Singapore, then why not? You know, if they get better economic freedoms there, then why not? And it's not just economic freedoms, it's also economies of scale. So that whole challenge of how many people can you reach within five hours flight, Singapore, five point, sorry, 3.5 billion from Singapore and 550 million from the US. Up until recently, that didn't matter too much because in the US you had wealthy consumers. So the argument was, well, fine, you can access seven times as many people from Singapore as you can from the US, but the people you're accessing from Singapore are low grade, low spend consumers. That's not the case anymore. You know, the middle class is in cities like Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing, Singapore are no different from the middle classes in New York or San Francisco. They have as much money, they have the same kind of spending patterns. So that idea that, you know, this is just billions of poor rural workers is just disappearing. Okay, let's have a look at where some of the exciting growth opportunities are right now. We talked about Vietnam as the one of the, the fastest growing markets in the world. Um, that's on an average, but let's have a look, for example, at just last year, sorry, just predictions for 2018. These five markets here alone a minimum of 6% annual growth rate. Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Philippines, Vietnam. All of these markets are coming online. Myanmar is an example. 50 million consumers are coming online. 52 million consumers, according to this quote here. And nobody knows anything about them. They're all now getting money. They're all accessing the, in accessing the internet, often on their mobile phones. They're buying stuff on the internet. And it's, it's carte blanche. People don't know what the history of these consumers are. So it really is, you know, frontier markets. Let's talk about some of the big news coming out in the next few years. This is really the seminal tipping point. So trend number 10, the tipping point, it's going to happen in 2020. The, the Chinese economy will pass the US economy in 2020. They'll both be around, what, that figure there, which is about 17 million, seven, sorry, 17 trillion dollars. So in 2020, China and the US will be about the same. China will pass the US in 2020. It'll be the biggest economy in the world. There's no argument about that. And then by 2050, the difference will be 13 trillion dollars. Staggering. China will be ahead of the US by 13 trillion dollars. China will be almost 50% larger than the US by 2050. So within a generation, the geopolitical landscape will shift radically in the sense that what was once a given factor, unchallenged, unchallenged dominance in the world, will now be questioned. People will start to say, you know, why am I keeping all my federal, all my reserve currency in dollars? Why are we borrowing this money from the US, all this treasury lending, which is given away and, and not being paid back as well? You know, the US has got a license to print money and lend this money to treasuries around the world who aren't paying it back because they don't want to default. They don't want to disrupt the value of the dollar. But, you know, once people start holding those treasuries in Chinese currency, then it's going to be a very different matter because nobody wants to disrupt the hegemony. Hegemony, I keep getting that wrong, because they hold all their reserves in dollars. I mean, Saudi Arabia is a good example, right? But what happens when now they start holding all their reserves in Chinese currency? See, that's when the geopolitical landscape shifts. It's not just a, 
a cut, a break. It's a gradual process. It starts with people realizing that China is the world's biggest economy. I'm going to start keeping my reserves in Chinese currency. I'm going to keep less in the US. And because of that, I now have less geopolitical dependence on the US. Let's shift from politics to mindset. And here's what's very interesting about the Asian economy is just how different the Asians are in terms of their mindset. I'm talking about Asians living in Asia and people living in Asia, not just Asians, about their mindset and attitudes towards business, optimism, and life in general. I want to share some of this data here. Positive attitudes towards immigration. So right at the bottom of this list here, France. Obviously, France has had a rather sketchy history, not just in the last few years, but generally, like the UK, a history of colonialism, which has its you know, blowback, which they're experiencing now. Attitudes towards immigration. Which countries are the most open to immigration? The three countries at the top of this list here are surveyed by YouGov in 2016 are India, Vietnam, and the Philippines. India, Vietnam, and the Philippines are open to people coming into their country and starting businesses, creating wealth. And that is fascinating because... Look at the history of these three countries, India, Vietnam, Philippines. They all have been colonized to some degree by the countries at the bottom of the list. India, obviously the UK, and to some degree Portugal, Vietnam, France, and the US, and the Philippines, Spain, and the US. They've all had a, quite a negative history with immigration. But now they're the most positive about immigration, which I find is fascinating and great as well, because... Immigration is key to the startup ecosystem. 26% of the startups in the US, in Silicon Valley, sorry, have some connection to founders who are from abroad. So they are immigrants themselves. Without immigration, you wouldn't have companies like, for example, um, most obviously Google to guys who are you know, from immigrant families from Russia. So, you know, that was typical. I mean, talking about Sergey Brin as an example. Um, and Andy Grove from Intel was an immigrant from Hungary, I believe. Uh, Jeff Bezos was the son of an immigrant family, somewhere, again, in Eastern Europe. Um, and Steve Jobs was the son of, let me get this right, North African immigrants. I can't remember quite where it was in the world. Forgive me, I'll get that wrong, but somewhere Syria maybe sorry not North Africa Syria Middle Eastern immigrants but anyway you can go down the list and there's a, a large percentage of startups that have connections to immigrant founders without immigration there you know you you have a hole a big hole in the startup ecosystem again this is reflected in this survey here globalization is a force for good again at the top of the list Vietnam Philippines India now, I have a lot of friends who have gone to Vietnam and set up in Vietnam, and a big proportion of those are from the US. And some people in the US still think that if they go to Vietnam, they're going to see the imagery that they'll see on the, the Vietnam movies. So if you grew up in that generation in the 80s, you would have seen a lot of Vietnam movies like Apocalypse Now, or you would have seen Good Morning Vietnam, or whatever it was, you would have been... You know, these images were burned on your mind. The images of the Viet Cong, um, you know, like booby traps, all those kind of things. They're sort of really negative images. And that happened. I mean, obviously, that was the 70s and the 80s. That did happen. And it still exists there. You can still go and see, you know, the remnants of the Vietnam War and the tunnels and, you know, where the Viet Cong hid out and all these kind of things. They exist. But Vietnamese people are very, very open to the world and very keen to do business with America, contrary to what maybe Americans think Vietnamese think of them, right? If you get what I mean, is that Vietnam is very open, positive about the future, whereas maybe Americans think, oh God, you know, I can't go to Vietnam because, you know, they're going to hate me for the historical legacy we left in Vietnam. Not the case. Vietnam, top of this list here in terms of a, again, a YouGov survey about globalization as a force for good. Vietnam, 92%. 92% of people surveyed said globalization is a force for good. Contrast that with France, only 37%. The bottom three in this list, UK, USA, France. The bottom three, which really have been, 
at the vanguard of globalization for the last 200 years now are the least positive about it. I find that fascinating. And it's not just positivity about globalization or immigration, but also about technology. It's a survey here from Ford Research Data, which asked people how they're confident or, you know, could they see themselves owning an autonomous car? That's a fascinating question to ask. Can you do you see yourself owning an autonomous car? Because that question is quite emotional. It's, do you see yourself owning? Like, do you think that that will become a part of your life? Because the cars are a big part of our life. Do you see yourself as part of that? And it's a straightforward yes or no question, really. What kind of countries would come at the top and bottom of that that survey? Well, you know the the. the Criteria here, really, there's a lot of factors going on, but let's talk about who actually came at the top and the bottom. Top of this survey, India at 84%. 84% of Indians surveyed said they could see themselves owning an autonomous car, followed by China and then Brazil, and bottom of the list, the US and the UK. Now, draw your own conclusions from this. My theory is that, firstly, it's a lot to do with car existing and car ownership. So if you own a car now, then you're probably least likely to see yourself owning an autonomous car uh, because maybe it's more a question about what are you going to lose. And also incumbent industries. I mean, if you work for Ford, then maybe you're less likely to say you see yourself owning an autonomous car or if you're connected to the auto industry. So India, for example, has less of uh, a historical legacy in terms of the automotive industry there. So maybe that's the reason why they're at the top. They've got less to lose. Same in AI. There's a lot of talk in AI these days and robotics about how robots are going to re replace human beings. What I find fascinating with this is that uh, the, what they're basically saying in this, this survey here, which asks uh, respondents to choose AI as the next indispensable technology how many percentage of those respondents said yes? In China, 15% said yes. Japan, 10%. Right at the bottom, Europe. So what happened here is that uh, in China and Japan and Asia in generally, executives, when asked, saw themselves, saw AI as the next indispensable technology. Whereas in the US and Europe, they didn't rank it so highly. So they, they're more likely to see it as a key technology, not necessarily asking you if it's a good technology, but it's slightly biased that question. So what I'm drawing as a conclusion from this is that China and Japan and Asia in general are more open to AI than they are in the rest of the world. And maybe that's partly as a result of the media coverage about AI in the world, especially in the West and how it's going to replace all our jobs and turn us into, you know, burger flippers. Same in Bitcoin. Trend number 16 in the 50 Trends report. Look at the Bitcoin transactions by region. Asia, Asia Pacific, 160 million, I believe, 160,000. So maybe that's, I can't, I can't work it out from this data here, but there are five times as many Bitcoin transactions in Asia as there are North America on a daily basis and 50, sorry, 30 times as many in Asia as there are in Europe. So if you add up the whole world, Asia, four times as many Bitcoin transactions in Asia as there are in the rest of the world. So, you know, there's a real belief in Bitcoin here. Again, uh, that adoption of technology and openness to new technology. Let's move on to entrepreneurship because this is a core component of the startup ecosystem. There's a lot of talk about this generation in America being the millennial generation. But the reality is, is that that's not necessarily the case. Look at trend number 17. And this is a survey from the Wall Street Journal, which plots, sorry, this is data from this Wall Street Journal. It plots the share of households headed by somebody under 13 that has a stake in or owns a privately held business. So how many households are there an entrepreneur stroke investor in? If you were to listen to the media, we would assume that, this figure is going up because millennials are all about entrepreneurialism. The sad fact is in the US, this has declined from 10% in 1990 to just over 3% today. So what 
we're saying here is that entrepreneurship rates for people under 30 have declined by almost two thirds since the 80s and 90s. In one generation, there are only one third of the entrepreneurs that there were back then, which I find astonishing. You know, for every three entrepreneurs, there were, when I grew up and graduated, there's now only one. So what does this mean? It means that the millennial generation today in America are not the entrepreneurial generation. This is the least entrepreneurial generation of all. So all that BS about millennial generation is just hype. The question is, where are entrepreneurs going? Well, partly they're disappearing, they're just not there in America, and partly they're going to America, sorry, to, <laughs> to Asia. And one of the reasons is, is that Asia is working really hard. It's working its butt off to attract entrepreneurs. Um, there's, the two, there's two drivers here in terms of entrepreneurialism in Asia. I want to talk about these. The first one is, going back here, is people from outside moving into Asia. That's a small percentage. And the second one, much more fundamental one, is Asians are now churning out entrepreneurs. Whereas, you know, the old joke being Indian father says to son or daughter, you can be anything you want, doctor, engineer, doctor. That was the choice that was presented to a previous generation of Indians. But now 83% of Indian surveys said they would love to become an entrepreneur. And actually, now people are setting up and doing it. You have these hubs of innovation like Bangalore and Mumbai, where people are actually doing this now. And in Hong Kong, for example, 20% in Hong Kong had entrepreneurship intentions. And 9.9.5% 9 actually started or operated a new business, which is a growth. It grew by 159% in eight years. So entrepreneurship in in Asia is up. Go back to the data. Entrepreneurship in America is down significant. Entrepreneurship in Asia is up. Take Go back to our favorite city now, Shenzhen. 16% of the adult population in Shenzhen are engaged in entrepreneurship. That is phenomenal figures. Because Okay, if you exist in the startup ecosystem, you may think that, wow, this is quite low. Everybody around me is an entrepreneur. But you've got to remember that startup ecosystems are a small part of a bigger industry. You've got to think about finance, real estate, heavy industry. There are millions and millions of people who have nothing to do with startups in a normal city. So when 16% of the population, adult population, are engaged in entrepreneurship, that is phenomenal. I would estimate that Shenzhen is probably in the lead, in the top, at least in the top five in the world in terms of entrepreneurship levels by city. And largely, those are immigrants from other parts of China. And outside as well, I'd say a lot of people I know, friends have moved to Shenzhen to be part of this. Shenzhen is becoming the new... A hub of entrepreneurship for the world. And, you know, what's happening in Silicon Valley, sorry, what's hap what happened in Silicon Valley in the 1880s and 90s is now happening in Shenzhen. And there's a shift which I call the Asian FOMO, Asian fear of missing out. And there were three stages in this chart, which is slide 39 in the report. Uh, trend number 20, and this is through three stages of evolution that we are experiencing and the shift of talent. So where do the best young things go when they look for opportunity? In the 80s and 90s, and I was part of this, I moved to Japan in the mid-90s. They were the pioneers. So they moved to Asia because what the heck? It's a challenge. It's exciting. It's travel. There was a huge risk. But it was a lifestyle choice for us. We moved to Asia. I moved to Japan in 1995 at the end of the bubble. You know, I grew up on stories of Japan being the country that was growing at 30% GDP per year. And it did during the 70s and 80s. There were a number of years where it grew at 30 to 34%, which is just phenomenal. I mean, you don't get that in China today. So it's a frontier market. It was exciting. It was new. 
it was groundbreaking. It, you know, it was virgin territory. It really was settler mindset. You know, there weren't any uh, Indian shooting arrows and we didn't have to circle the coaches, but it, you know, it was still very much the same kind of mindset. We we're going to go out there. We we're going to make something. That shifted later in 2000 to today. We're in this opportunist phase, which is where the risk has been reduced significantly in Asia now. And people can actually see the opportunities right there in front of them. And those opportunities are, okay, so here is here, here are the three things that people used to talk about why Silicon Valley was always better than Asia. It's like capital, it was access to talent, it was access to consumers. Well, we've talked about the consumer part, three and a half billion people. That's gone. So that risk is gone now. You could be based in Asia and have access to people who can afford your service, right? That was never the case in you know, the 80s and 90s, you know, if you were developing some kind of uh, financial service, you you were dealing with a very, very small subset of a subset of people in Asia, po possibly expats. But now you have hundreds of millions of middle class people who have wealth. So the first one was cap, sorry, the first one was access to consumers, then in reverse order, the talent thing, we'll talk about that in a minute, that how now talented people are moving to Asia, if you want to get talent, Asia for example, Singapore is number one in the world in terms of startup ecosystem talent, according to the Startup Genome Report. And then capital, as we'll discover in this report, there is wealth of capital now in Asia. So all those three points, which were always the reason why Asia was a risk and Silicon Valley or any other ecosystem in the West was less of a risk, have disappeared. Capital, access to talent, access to consumers are gone. That those barriers are gone now. So we're now in the era of the opportunist where it's there. If you want it, Asia is there for you. There are real opportunities here in Asia. So we're seeing a shift. In the last couple of years, the amount of people I know have shifted from Western countries to Asia has exponentially exploded. And now phase three is upon us. And phase three is about fear of missing out. We have sat through these two waves now the third wave is coming through where people are saying, and this will start in 2020, I believe, and it's just creeping in now. If I'm not in Asia, I'm missing out. So the followers will come through in the wake of these first two waves of people, the pioneers and the opportunists, and the followers are coming now. And that is the bulk, that is the 80% of the market where the talent will come and say, okay, I've graduated from Harvard, or I've graduated from Stanford, or I've graduated from INSEAD. I've got to go to Asia because that is where I'm going to make or break my career. And if I don't go to Asia, it's not going to be on my resume. I'm going to miss out on all these opportunities. That is happening next. Hopefully, you've enjoyed the first 20 trends from my 20 trend, 50 trends, I should say, report, which you can get from my website, asiatechresearch.com. You can go and download a copy of that report there for free. 20 trends in the bag. I'll resume next part next update for you with 20 new insights on the Asian tech ecosystem. And just flicking through, there's a lot to dip into here. We're going to learn a lot about the demographic uh, factors driving the Asian market. I'll see you in the next update.